quiet time with the Lord, I um, I had this, you know, just sometimes when you get before the Lord, there's just this constant thing that keeps um, resonating in your spirit. You know, he'll he'll bring it to you over and over and over again. And this was one of those weeks where just in my time with him, he just really honed in on an area. And and um, in just a moment, I'm going to read to you a scripture, our main scripture text from Isaiah but if you remember a few weeks ago, I preached out of Isaiah 35. And it was, it's talking about, it's describing the kingdom of God, the future kingdom of God, and how when the Lord comes to rule and reign just for our, in our eternity, but also in the soul of man through the, the relationship with Jesus Christ, he said that there will be the springs of, of living water that will bubble up in your soul. Like where the dry places were, there would be refreshment. And, and he promises all these things from Isaiah 35. And it, it tells us to encourage the exhaust, exhausted, to strengthen the feeble, to say to the anxious heart, to take courage and fear not. Because the Lord is coming and when he comes, he comes with a vengeance. And all the hardships and all the things that we faced on this earth will be no more. But until that time, he reminds us, we need to encourage the exhausted. We need to strengthen the feeble. And we need to say to those who were downtrodden, take courage. Take courage because the Lord is on your side. This week, as I was just in my prayer time, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the presence of God, the kingdom of God, because kingdom of God represents in our lives the presence of God. You understand when it says kingdom, it's talking about his presence, where he rules, where he reigns. We know that he rules and he reigns in the, in the heavenlies, but he rules and he reigns in our hearts, the heart of mankind, those who have received Jesus so there's, we also know that there's the manifest presence of God versus the omnipresence of God. Like the omnipresence of God is the fact that he is everywhere. Like where David wrote, there's nowhere that I can go that your spirit doesn't find me. There's nowhere that I can go that your spirit is not there. If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths of hell, you're there. Like there's nowhere that we can run that God can't find us, that his spirit is not. He is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he is spirit, and there's nowhere that his presence is not there. But then there's the manifest presence of God. And not everyone experiences the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God is when you know that you have come into contact with the spirit of the living God. And it just grips your soul. Like you understand. Like I, I hope that you opened your heart enough to understand, to sense, and to the manifest presence of God in this room today. Because He is here. And if you cannot sense Him, this is not judgment, but you need to, 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 to make your heart a little more available to the Lord. Because his manifest presence is here today. Hallelujah. Oh, God. God help me. In Isaiah 35, I didn't sense when I preached on this message a few weeks ago. I got to a certain verse. I got to verse 7. And I said, this is all, Lord. This is where you want me to stop, God. Like, this is all you have for today. Weeks have gone by, and I just cannot get the rest of this, the next few verses out of my heart and out of my soul. Isaiah 35, verses 8 through 10. This is out of the New International Version. And a highway will be there, and it will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing 
Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Can you not wait until that, that where it says that gladness and joy will overtake them? Like gladness and joy will overtake them. So that everything else that we've had to walk through and experience is going to fall away. And that gladness and joy will be there. And it will be there forevermore. Like forevermore. I used to hear pastors say, your best day on earth is nothing compared to what it's going to be like in heaven. The most beautiful place you've ever seen on earth is, is, is nothing compared to what we'll see, what he's preparing for us. We know that this passage of Scripture, it's a, it's a prophetic word from as, as the Spirit of God directed the prophet Isaiah to write these words. It's a prophetic word about the gift of eternal life that we receive through Jesus Christ. He's talking here about a highway of holiness, the way of holiness. When you today, as a, you hear me say this, uh, uh, share the, the heart of God, I'm going to mention very many times. The highway of holiness. The highway of holiness. This is what we're talking about. The highway of holiness. He says the highway of holiness is reserved for those who will walk with the Lord. It's reserved for those who will walk in the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. Only ones that are going to be allowed on the highway are those who are truly surrendered to Jesus. The highway of holiness are for those who truly belong to him. On this highway, there's no unclean spirits allowed. There's no ravenous beast. There's no wicked fools. That means lazy fools that have been just lazy in this life that we've been blessed to have. The highway of holiness is intended for the believer The highway of holiness is the journey that we are on. Once you say yes to Jesus, your life begins. Do you understand? You don't wait until you get to heaven to begin your eternal life. When you say yes to Jesus, your eternity begins. And that is what this is talking about. That your eternity begins once you've said yes to Jesus. And the Bible teaches us that on this highway, we are safe. Like, and on this highway, we are protected. But I need you to hear me. On both sides of the highway, there are pitfalls. On both sides of the highway, there are ditches. And you say, well, how could that be? If it's the highway of holiness. Because based on Scripture, Scripture tells us so. The Bible says that in the last days, that the love of many will grow cold because of the increase of of lawlessness on the earth. Because of all the increase of the troubles, because of the increase of the sin, the increase of the wickedness, because of the increase of wicked people who just give out. Their love for people will grow cold first, and then their love for the things of God, and then their love for God. It's a waning away. Most people don't just get up and say, I think I'm going to become a heathen today. If they really know the Lord Jesus. But he says in the last days that the love of many will grow cold. It also says that in the last days that many will be deceived. That many will be led away. And that many will fall away because of false prophets. I need you to hear me. False prophets. That just means false teaching. Wrong teaching. Wrong preaching. Not taking the word for what the word really means. It doesn't mean that you fall all of a sudden and you start worshiping Buddha. Or you start worshiping the the various gods in the earth, Islam. You don't go after their religion. No, just false teaching. Wrong teaching. Believing things that are not true in the word of God. That don't line up with the word of God. He said that many will be deceived. Many will fall away. Do you understand? Both of these ditches are talking about people that were once on the highway. They were once following Jesus. They were once, once they had said yes to him. 
But yet some of them fell because they didn't love the Lord like they should any longer. Because things got so difficult and things got so messed up and their eyes got on the things of the earth, earth, on the things of the world. But then you've got these others that started to listen to things that they shouldn't have listened to, teachings that they shouldn't have listened to, preachers that that didn't give the Lord the, the strength that is in this word, that didn't preach the truth of the full gospel of Jesus Christ. There's these two ditches on both sides. This, this is it. Help me, God. If we want to be protected in our walk with Christ, we have to stay on this highway. We have to stay on the highway. I want us to look at that this morning. There are two things that must be operating. Not one or the other, but two things that must be operating in your life if you are going to stay on... Y'all just leave that picture up there if you can. On this highway, there are two things that must be in your life. Because on this highway, you're protected by the presence of God. This highway, I want you to get this picture in your mind. You are protected by the presence of Almighty God if you were on the straightaway right there, if you're on the highway. Two things, the fear of the Lord and the influence of the Holy Spirit. The church age that we're living in now, they tend to lean to one direction or the other. And you cannot. You have to have both in your life. You've got certain churches that are all about holiness and they're all about the fear of God. Then you've got some that are all about the Holy Ghost. If you get too far one way or the other, you risk falling off the highway into the ditch. Some Christians that that are all about holiness, they treat God as if he's far away. They forget that he wants to be intimately involved in your life. Like there's this this, this sense of, of him not being involved. They, and then there's these others that are about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and they've almost become casual in their walk with God. Like, he's my friend. You can be a friend of God. The Scripture tells you you can be a friend of God, but it also says you have to have the fear of God inside your life or you will not be considered the friend of God. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but there are stipulations according. I'm telling you, I, I was at a meeting this week, and, I, and, and John Bevere was the guest speaker. And God had already been stirring this passage from Isaiah in my heart. He's been stirring it for, year, for, for years, for weeks, since I preached it last time. And I hear John Bevere make a comment, and I literally said, I don't know that I believe that. I mean, honestly, it's not that I thought he was not saying like he was leading us astray. He wasn't a false prophet. I just didn't know that in my heart I was settled. Maybe I didn't understand it correctly. But, you know, you you need to prove these things out in the Word of God. And so I I thought, Lord, and I began to search, and it was amazing how quickly I ended up back in Isaiah 35. So you've got these churches, and some seem to, to, not even churches, believers, but yes, churches, some are more about the holiness, the fear of God. They become legalistic. They become ritualistic. They become religious. And then you've got these others that are so casual, and it's just a, it, 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 the friend of God. Everybody's a friend of God. I prayed the prayer, so now I'm a friend of God. Now I get to go to heaven. It's almost so casual. Here, I'm not, and I need you to hear me. I'm not talking about because we wear blue jeans to church that we're too casual. I'm not talking about because we have some cool things that the young people like on our platform now. I'm talking about the soul. We don't want to be what he says, though the lazy, wicked ones will not be on this highway. That's what he's talking about here. I mean, this is the truth. We serve a holy God. We serve a God to be feared, to be honored, to be reverenced. But I'm telling you, he desires to be our friend. But it's not a casual acquaintance. And we cannot treat him like a casual acquaintance. Because he wants to be so intimately involved in our lives. <clears throat> For us to remain on this highway, we have to have both the fear of God in our life and we have to have the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
I hope you're awake this morning. We have to have both operating in our lives. The love of many will grow cold, the scripture says. This, love, this growing cold, this in, because of the increase of lawlessness, it leads to a lukewarmness. It leads to a numbness in our hearts. Many will be deceived because of incorrect teaching, things that are contrary to the truth, and then there's a great falling away. The problem is they don't know that they've fallen away. The falling away is not necessarily an obvious thing. Do you understand when we read in Scripture that even the elect will fall away? It's not like they just say, okay, I'm not going to serve God anymore. I'm going to go out and become an addict. I'm going to go out and, and, and get addicted to other things. I'm going to go out and have an affair. It's not those things. They just fall away from their love for God. I want you to picture this. As we go through this message, I want you to picture something like this in your mind. Just a highway that goes straight ahead as far as the eyes can see. But the only difference is there's a gate in the front of the highway. And you have to pass through the gate one at a time to get onto the highway. Jesus is the gate. He says that in the Word. He is the gate. And this highway is the highway to eternal life with him. I want you to picture this as we go through this. On both sides of this highway, that there are pitfalls. On one side, the wrong teaching, the deception. This is what came to me this morning as I was, as I was looking back over my message notes. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says, They will not want to tolerate sound doctrine. But they'll be led to teachers that'll what? Tickle their ears. They'll go places where what they want to hear preached is preached. But it won't necessarily be the fullness of the word of God. There's a deception. There's a leading away. It's the itching ears. Things that don't line up with the fullness of the word. Things that don't line up with Jesus' words. It leads to this great falling away. And then on the other side, there's lawlessness. There's sin that leads to this lukewarmness and this numbness. If we are not living under the fear of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit, we are capable of falling into one of those ditches ourselves. If you have said yes to Jesus, and if you think that could never happen to me, then woe is you. Woe is me. Like if we ever think, I could never do that. Because that statement in itself is rooted in pride. Because the truth is, the Lord tells us He is, he is with those and he, is, he strengthens us in our weakness and He just wants us to walk humbly before Him. Well, to say that would never happen to me is not a humble statement. Not a humble statement. <coughs> Jesus said this. He said, broad is the gate. The gate means the doorway, right? The entranceway. Broad is the gate. That leads to the path of destruction. But narrow is the gate. Narrow is the pathway that leads to life. Jesus is the narrow gate. Jesus is the narrow path. The highway of holiness is a narrow highway. He said this. In this scripture, what he's saying is there's more people that are going to follow the pathway that leads to hell than the pathway that leads to life. It's not his will. It's not his desire. He gave his life so that everyone that would just believe and follow him can walk on the highway and can spend an eternity with him in his presence. Hallelujah. He came, Scripture says, so that we could have life and life to the fullest. Life more abundantly. The fullness of life. But that life is only found in His presence. I'm telling you, in His presence, we'll only go where it's welcomed. And there are certain... I'm talking about His manifest presence. I'm not talking about His omnipresence. 
His omnipresence is everywhere. We already said that. But the manifest presence of God where something in your soul goes, hallelujah, God is here. You know, there's an, 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 this awakening that we keep talking about. We need to be awakened. Yes, as a church, we need to be awakened as believers. But the truth is, I mean, God has done everything that he is going to do. He has given everything that we need for life and godliness. He will be with you if you call out for his help and for call upon the name of the Lord. But the truth is, I mean, there, there, this awakening, we keep praying for an awakening and awakening. Yes, we need to be awakened, but we just need to step into everything he's already said that is ours. And we need to do what he said for us to do. There's this gate and there's this highway, and when you say yes to Jesus, he's the gate. He's the entranceway to heaven. He's the entranceway to eternal life. And then there's this highway, and on this highway is the presence of Almighty God. His presence only goes where it's welcomed. His presence only goes. His manifest presence only goes where people fear him and honor him and reverence him. Do you know what that tells me? that a lot of people in the church are not experiencing the manifest presence of God. That's why we can sit in a room. And I'm not talking about just here. Please know this. We can sit in a room. And, man, you can have the most amazing band and you can have the most amazing singers and never sense the presence of God because they don't honor Him the way that they're supposed to. They don't reverence Him the way. They don't fear God like they're supposed to. And then you can go somewhere else where, I mean, there was a lady one time years ago that sang special music at a church that we went to years ago. And I, you know, let's just say God bless her. Singing was not necessarily her gift. But on Sunday night, they would let her sing because her heart so much wanted to sing for the Lord. And I never will forget. You know what I'm talking about? Her singing that one song, that song, Father's Eyes. One time, and I mean, every play, everybody in the house was just, was just tears flowing because, I mean, something about just the sweet presence of God just fell in that room. Why? Because she honored God. She loved God. He was so much to her. He was everything to her. The manifest presence of God will only go where it's welcomed, where people fear Him and honor Him. The Bible, in many places, it says this. It says, do not turn aside from the Word of God. Do not turn away from the law of God. Do not turn to the right or to the left. I want you to see the Scripture, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. Let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left, Turn your foot from evil. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Turn away from evil. In a world that is full of darkness and is full of deception and that is increasing in lawlessness, how do we do this? How do we do this? We keep our eyes on Jesus. We keep our eyes, our focus on Him. We're not drawn to the right or to the left when we keep our eyes on the path that He has before us. We're not drawn to lawlessness. We're not drawn to sin. We're not drawn to wrong teaching. We're not drawn to, to things that don't line up with the Word. The temptation may come. A temptation is not a draw. Listen to me. The temptation can be a fleeting thought. The draw is when it begins to pull you in that direction. It's like a current. We keep our eyes. We stay grounded in the fear of God. We stay very aware of the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But the influence of the Holy Spirit according to the Word. I want to say it again. Holiness. The fear of the Lord. If, we, if we're so one-sided there, because I'm going to be real. If we're not real careful there, there's a spiritual pride that will rise up inside of us. Because we know stuff. But when we have that spiritual pride rise up inside of us, we lack the sensitivity to the Spirit of God. 
this holiness, this, this fear of God, if we are not maturing and growing in the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there's something amiss. We risk falling into pride, and the Scripture tells us pride goes before a haughty spirit, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. We can't risk to be all one-sided and all about the fear of God and not growing and understanding about the Holy Spirit. But those that are on this other side that are so driven by the Holy Spirit and they don't learn what it is to fear and honor God as the Lord, they truly put themselves out there in a way to, be, to, to risk being deceived, to chasing spiritual fads because they lack a fear of the Lord. Because the fear of God, hear me, the fear of God is what gives you the ability to discern the things of the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord. I don't have slides for these. I'm going to read you a few verses. Psalm 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who practice it have a good understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who practice what? The fear of the Lord. And all who practice walking, learning to live by the fear of God, they will have a good understanding. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is, is a hatred for evil. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The one that, that one may avoid snares of death. The one who fears the Lord avoids these traps. Avoids those things that the enemy sets for you to cause you to, be, to fall into these pits. I want you to think about this. This is the highway, and it is headed straight towards the mountain of Zion. I love that picture that I found this morning. I mean, it's just sometimes it helps to have a visual. Okay, so this is the highway. You've gone through the gate. If you've accepted Jesus, some of you I don't know. Some of you may need to accept Jesus in your heart. But, I mean, you, if you've said yes to Jesus and you've stepped onto this eternal highway, this eternal highway that is taking you on this journey to heaven, you see these bumper guards. I really believe the Lord gave me this picture in my mind. You see these bumper guards on the side of this highway. Because, remember, there's ditches on both sides that the church can fall in that believers can fall in. Those bumper guards represent the fear of God. I believe this with all my heart. The bumper guards represent the, the, the guardrails, you want to call them. They represent the fear of God. This fear of God, it's wisdom, it's understanding, it's knowledge, it's to, to hate evil, it's a fountain of life. It says also the fear of God. It's our strong confidence. It leads to life. How blessed are those who fear God? How blessed are those who stay on the highway? How blessed are those who honor his presence? I hope y'all are listening this morning. I really hope. I, 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 I told Pat, I said, oh, this is like burning in my soul. I hope I can relay this in a way that God wants me to relay it. I believe that this is so important for the church today. So important. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, it says this, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This scripture, this is written by Solomon. He's known as the wisest man. He wrote these words, fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. To fear God means to stand in awe and reverence of who he is. To fear God means there's a holy fear. Not that you're afraid that he's going to wipe you out. He loves you. But there's a holy fear about being in his presence. A holy fear about his awesomeness. There's a reverence about his majesty. There's a recognition that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he's also the Almighty God, the creator of the earth. He is the, he's everything. 
It seems that, that for ages the, the church lived in this, this, this one side of it's all about the fear of God. I'm telling you, when I studied this, I went all the way back to 1900 to look at the different things that the church in America has walked through. The changes, the seasons. It's amazing. Some were wonderfully led of the Holy Spirit and some were powerful moves. People getting saved, people going to Bible college, churches churches were growing, and others were right the opposite. We have to ask why. I believe because we've lost the church, lost the fear of God, what it is to truly fear Him. Like, I want you to hear me, and this is not judgment, but like, if you could get more excited... It's not judgment. And I understand this is, this, is, this is on my heart and this is burning in my soul. And I understand some of you, this might be the first time that you've ever heard it. My husband has to remind me. Like, it, it, it's, it's already in you. You've been studying this for weeks. <laughs> They've never heard it before. Because I'm like, wow, how could you not get excited about this word? So what I've asked God today is for a supernatural revelation. That you won't hear my words. Don't ever hear my words. That you hear the heart of God. And God is saying there's a highway and it's leading to eternal life. And if you've said yes to Jesus, you're on the highway. But there are pitfalls. And you can fall into being lukewarm or you can fall into being deceived. And we have to be careful. And the only thing that is going to keep you on this highway without falling is the fear of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And you cannot have one without the other. I'm going to show you that in Scripture. You cannot have one without the other. Hallelujah. You have to have both operating in your life. This fear of God, this sense of religiosity, this legalism, this lack of sensitive to the Spirit. I mean, it's like you keep God at a far-off distance. You don't allow Him in in your life in the fullness that He desires to be. He becomes some holier-than-thou God. When he says, I want to be your friend, I want to lead you, I want to guide you, I want to direct you, I want to convict you, I want to draw you to myself. But I'm not some friend that's your equal peer. I am the holy God. He can be both. We have to learn that. But he desires to be both. He desires to. To be both. If we focus on the movement of the Holy Spirit, then we get all zealous about movements and about experiences and about feelings. And then we say, well, I can't feel God. So he must be far away. He must have left me. It's not about what you feel. It is great when you feel the presence of God. There's nothing like it. But just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he's not there. However, when you're seeking him, and he's not coming near. That's time to do an inventory of your soul. An inventory of your heart. Because he says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. So when you're drawing near to him and he's not coming near, there's something amiss. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It just truly means that there's something amiss. And he wants to draw us in. He wants to let us see that it's the, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not a bad thing. The fear of the Lord protects us. The fear of the Lord keeps us exactly where we need to be in our walk with Him. If we become too zealous about the movement of the Holy Spirit, we're ungrounded. We can be spiritually mature. I was thinking this morning, and I was thinking about the Scripture in Ephesians, I think it's 4, that Paul says this. He said, you can be carried away and tossed around by every wind of doctrine. Like you believe this right now and then you believe this this time and then you believe this and and it's all about the word. It never changes. It never shifts. This last day falling away, this last day deception is because we get too one-sided. We either get a lack of of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit because we're all about, well, I fear God and you shouldn't do that. It's legalism. Legalism. We're just as bad as they are if we're judging them. You can judge the fruit. But we don't know the man's, we don't know anybody else's heart. We don't even know our own if we don't ask the Lord. He's the one who searches the heart. 
He's the one that knows the motives in our heart. God, help us. This falling away, this deception of the last days, the Lord, he, he warns the church of this. You understand, if you don't know Jesus, you can't fall away. This is talking about believers in the last days. We don't know the situation of our heart. We don't know the situation of our soul if we don't stop and ask him. You understand, people who are deceived don't know they're deceived. We don't know if we don't ask. In Matthew 10, 28, it says, and, be afraid, and, and don't be afraid of the one who can kill the body, but that's unable to kill the soul. But instead, be afraid, or not afraid as in frightful, be fearful of, of or, or show fear unto the one who can kill the body and the soul. It's not like people who said, I can't go to church, the walls will fall in. I mean, I've been so bad that, you know, God will just, he'll just, he'll just like in the Old Testament, I touch the presence, I touch the ark, and I'm dead. I know, I understand Ananias and Sapphira. They lied in the presence of God. There's a holy fear. And it should be operating in our lives. But everything that he does is because he loves us so much. Everything that he does. Don't be afraid of those who cannot kill the, the soul. All they can do is hurt your body. But be afraid of the one fearful, meaning honoring, but yet a holy fear of the one who can either send you to heaven for eternity or send you to hell. And he doesn't, he doesn't, I shouldn't say send. Actually, he sends, but it's only because we make the choice. He didn't create hell for people. He created hell for the devil. And we make the choice, are we going to stay on the highway or not? And he says, I've made a way for everyone to stay on the highway. In these last days, if we don't have both a fear of God and a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, it is dangerous ground. It is dangerous ground. If we are not growing in both, it's dangerous because we can get on one side or the other. And the scary thing is, we don't even recognize it in ourselves. Do you know why that's so important that you don't forsake gathering together in the body of Christ and you let yourself in on, you let people into your life? Because we are, we are charged to look out for one another. We're charged to carry one another's burdens. We're charged to love one another. If we're growing in the fear of God, and if we're growing in an understanding of the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, if we are growing in those two things, I'm telling you, we're a force to be reckoned with. Because there is nothing like it on the planet. Do you understand that? If you were growing in these areas in your life, the fear of God, a holy reverence. Sometimes I wonder, would we be more interested in having some famous celebrity or some famous athlete come in here and afterwards sign autographs? Or would we be okay with coming in here and just the hush of the Holy Spirit landing in this room? Because I can tell you, the only thing I desire is for His presence to be in this place. Every week. Every week. That we honor him. That we fear him. That we reverence him. Because he is holy. And he's prepared a place. And he is coming again. <laughs> and all sighing and all weeping and all struggles and all things will go away. And joy and gladness is going to overtake us. <laughs> overtake us. I want you to see this. Jesus himself had to walk in the fear of the Lord, and Jesus himself was influenced by the Holy Spirit. I want you to see this. Isaiah 33, verse 6. Again, New American Standard. He's, Isaiah here, he's, he's prophesying of the coming Messiah. He says, And he will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, Wisdom and knowledge. Do you hear those words? They seem to come up a lot. 
He will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure, it says. We should have a scripture for this one, hopefully. The fear of the Lord, Isaiah 33, 6. Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord. He walked in a holy reverence of who his father was. Like it says, he treasured it, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus treasured in his heart to please the father. Everything about his life, God, does it please you? Lord, does it please you? Do we ever stop as his children and say, God, does it please you? What's in my life that doesn't please you? That's showing the fear of God. Lord, I want to be right with you. Like, search me, God. What's in my life that's displeasing to you? The treasure in the heart of Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God. The treasure in his heart was to please his Father. He walked in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord was his treasure. Jesus also relied on the influence of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see another scripture from Isaiah. Chapter 11, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. On him, meaning Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is, again, prophetic of when Jesus would come on the earth. His kingdom of God would come. Then it says this, the spirit of wisdom, understanding. Have you heard those words before? Counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of God. The spirit of the Lord is going to rest on Jesus when he comes to the earth. And he's going to be full of the spirit of the Lord. It will rest. Jesus was the first one that the spirit rested upon. To rest is to remain. Right? Now when we receive Jesus, the Spirit's supposed to rest on us. The Spirit of God is supposed to remain in our lives. What this is telling us is the Spirit of God, one Holy Spirit, one Holy Spirit. It's not like a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of strength. I mean, it's not all these different. It's one Holy Spirit that has all these different faculties. But when he gives you the Holy Spirit, when you receive Jesus and you receive the Holy Spirit, he doesn't just give you the spirit of wisdom. He gives you all that he is. Now we have to grow and we have to mature and we have to allow the Lord to shape those things and we have to allow the Lord to strengthen those things. He doesn't just give you a piece of who he is. The spirit of the living God is all of these things, wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. It's part of the Holy Spirit. The fear of God is part of his nature. I need you to hear this part. The fear of God is part of the nature of the Holy Spirit. I need you to hear this. (laughs) Because I don't think the church has, has connected these in many ways. And we have to have both to be protected in these last days. And when I say protected, I'm not even talking about necessarily protected from the evil one. Sometimes it's being protected from ourselves, from our pride. The fear of God is part of the nature of the Holy Spirit. It's one of his facets. This is what this tells me. You cannot live under the authentic That's a key word. You can't live under the authentic influence of the Holy Spirit and lack the fear of God. Hear me. These people that are so spirit-driven, we have had people, God bless their souls, if you listen to this video or watch this on YouTube. We love them. But we have sat face-to-face with them and we have heard them say, we're just Holy Spirit junkies. Did they not use that word? We go where the Spirit leads us. Then how do you ever get grounded? How do you ever get planted? How do you really make an impact? 
I'm telling you, I think when we get so hung up on the, on the Holy Spirit, oh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, did you feel that today? You know, I love it when the Spirit of God moves and you just don't even want to move. I love it. But something's amiss if we don't under, understand what it is to honor God with our lives. The scripture says that when we give our lives to Jesus, our lives are no longer our own. Do you know what that tells me, young people? You need to ask them what you do with your life. You need to ask him who you date. You need to ask him where you go to college. You need to ask him for sure who you marry. Like, you need to ask him. Even adults, we need to ask him, is this okay for me? I'm telling you, I was in a, uh, well, I was in a local place. This past week, I hear this conversation going on. This woman, and she even looked at me on the way out the door and said, what would you think about that? I said, I think he needs to study the word a little more. I don't know who she's talking about. I don't even know who she is. She just for some reason looked at me and said that. She had this conversation going on, and she was talking about a gentleman in her church and how that this, this he, she had overheard some other ladies in the church and, and actually one of their husbands saying, can you believe it? I mean, they let him get up and make the announcements this week. Like, they were struggling with this. Like, do they not know his lifestyle? They were really struggling with it. And my first thought was, okay, well, they're just, you know, just, just busyness, busy bodies. I don't want to get sidetracked. But I'm going to tell you this. The conversation went like this. This gentleman has no problem with drunkenness. He has no problem with gambling and traveling all over the nation with casinos. No problem. And when they said, when the husband said to him, well, I'm amazed they let you on that platform today, joking with him, he said, I've read the Bible cover to cover, front to back, several times. Not one time do I see anything in that word that says I can't party and have a good time in this life. But do you think it's really going to say, do not go to casinos? There were no casinos. I'm not judging you if you go to casinos. I'm not your judge. But I'm telling you, we serve a God that is to be feared, and you need to be asking him if what you're doing in your life, that if you, if you are a child of God and you say, you are my Lord and you are my Savior, I believe you've saved me, I believe you've, you've forgiven me of my sins, and you've set me free from the, the sins and the, and the, the weights of darkness and the, and the draw to the, the slavery of sin. You've set me free. I believe that. Then there's another side. He's also Lord. That means Master. That means he tells us. And he's not going to tell you anything bad to do with your life. You don't have to be worried he's going to send me to China. He's only going to send you to China if he puts a desire in you and you want to go to China. He's not going to get you to go somewhere. He's going to get you to do something. That's, and he's not even going to get you to do something that's foolish. Okay, I didn't want to get off of this. You cannot live under the authentic influence of the Holy Spirit and lack of fear of God. Do you know what bothered me about the conversation that I heard with that gentleman? These were people in his church that were struggling. These were people in his church that were stumbling over his lifestyle. Maybe they shouldn't have been judging him, but at the same time, he shouldn't have been living a life that contradicts the, the, the Word of God and causing them to question. You need to make up your mind. You're in the church or you're out of the church. Don't ride the fence. You're either hot or you're cold. You are not lukewarm. Because he says in lukewarm, he would spew us out of his mouth. He would rather you be hot, representing full of God, full of the fire of God, meaning representing close to the Lord, directed by his Holy Spirit, than just to say, I'm just not a believer. He would rather you say that. Why? Because these people that ride the fence, what they do is they just damage the reputation of the kingdom of God. And he's saying, it's time for my church to fear me again. Like, it's time for my church to honor me again, to reverence me again. But it's also time for the Holy Spirit to be the one who directs us and leads us. He wants to be involved in your life. If you think that he doesn't want to be involved in your daily life, you're too far on the side of the ditch of fearing God. That's the truth. It's not judgment. Hallelujah. 
You cannot claim to have a fear of God and not be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Hear me. Just like you can't live under this authentic influence of the Holy Spirit, you can't live with, oh, I'm I'm all Holy Spirit. I'm a Holy Spirit junkie. I I just love it when I feel the Holy Spirit. But you have no care about what God thinks of your life. You can't live there. But on the other side, you can't just be like, okay, I'm all about God. What do you want to do with my life? What do you want to do with my life? And you never give him the access to lead you. Like he tries to prompt you to do something. And you, oh, I can't. I can't do that. Oh, I couldn't do that, God. Ask somebody else. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. That's not me, Lord. He wouldn't prompt you to do something that's good if he wasn't going to empower you to do it. Hallelujah. So we can't live under this authentic influence of the Holy Spirit and still have a lack of the fear of God, but we also can't claim to have a fear of God and not be influenced by the Holy Spirit, not be quickened by Him, not be convicted by Him, because you have to have both. When Solomon, he understood this when he wrote this. Do you understand when he wrote these words, he was directed by the Holy Spirit? Okay, when he wrote these words, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, I read it earlier. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he says, it's our duty as the children of God to fear Him. And to do what he commands. Jesus understood this himself in John 15 verse uh, 14. He said, you're my friends if you do what I command you. You are my friends. I love you no matter what. I gave my life no matter what. But you're my friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. So I want you to stay with me. To fear God is to honor him. But to fear God is to obey Him. Obedience is greater than sacrifice, the Scripture tells us. To fear Him is to honor Him. To fear Him is to obey Him. It requires that we let the Holy Spirit lead our lives. I'm not talking about where you get up in the morning and say, God, what am I supposed to wear? Let's not be foolish. I'm talking about with the things of the soul. With the things that matter, with, our, with our, our thoughts, with our attitudes, with our words, with the direction when he, when he prompts us, do we do it? Do we do what he says? When he says, be nice to that person, I know they've hurt you. I know they've betrayed you. I want you to be nice. When he says, you don't need to go there. You don't need to do that. Are we willing to just say, yes, God? Yes, Lord. To fear God is to honor Him, but it's to obey Him and to be led by His Holy Spirit. I want you to listen. I'm kind of trying to pull this all together. I know this goes so many ways. This is so broad. I'm trying my best to relay the heart of God. This is why the psalmist wrote this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Those are all part of the Spirit of God. Understand. I said this this Holy Spirit is wisdom and understanding, counsel and strength, knowledge and the fear of God. The fear of God is in the nature of the Holy Spirit. In this verse though, well, I'll get to the verse in just a minute. Let me back up for just a second. The psalmist writes this and, and he says the beginning, I read them a few minutes ago, the beginning of wisdom the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of understanding, all those things are in the fear of God. What he's saying is those things are facets of the Holy Spirit. They're in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what kicks off the Holy Spirit being able to operate in your life. That's what this is saying. If you're having a hard time hearing God, it's not judgment. But if you're having a hard time hearing Him, the first thing you need to do is check your fear meter. The first thing you need to do is check your honor meter. The first thing you need to do is say, God, is there anything in my life that is not pleasing to your heart? Because it can hinder you from having the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding that he has so freely gave. He's not going to not answer when we call. I think sometimes we're just not asking the right questions. And one of the first things we need to ask is, God, is there anything in me 
that displeases you. I'm telling you. Psalm 25, verse 14. This is so good. 25, 14. I'm not reading that version, but I'm, I'm reading, I believe, the New American Standard. But the secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him. And He will make known His covenant. The Lord confides in those who fear Him. Okay, you confide. You, give, you're, you, tell, you don't tell everybody your secrets. You don't confide in everyone. So it's, it's saying the same thing. He makes His covenant known to them. But this version, the secret of the Lord, I want you to hear this. The word secret in the Hebrew, this is what it means. It means counsel. It means fellowship. It means friendship. It means intimacy. Oh, this is so good. The intimate fellowship, friendship, counsel of the Lord is reserved for those who fear Him. Not everybody has the same relationship with the Lord because not everybody has the same level of honor and respect for who He is. But yet He desires that we all come to the full knowledge of who He is and what His Word means for us. The intimate fellowship, friendship, counsel of the Lord is reserved for those who fear Him. It's reserved for those who will stay on the highway. It's reserved for those who will stay away from sin and lawlessness. It's reserved for those who will stay away from deception and falling away. Because you, you're listening to things that are not true to the Word of God. Listen, you need to be checking. You can check mine. You can ask me for my notes. Because I'm human. I can tell you this. I pray. I pray over this message every week. I mean, I'm, I... I work out my message with fear and trembling. <laughs> because I know who I am. But I also know who I am in Him. And you have every right to check the Word. You have every right to test the Word. Why? Because I want my life to honor Him. I want my life to fear Him. I want His presence, His manifest presence in my life. All times. Psalm 25, 14, that was saying, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him. He reserves His intimate relationships with those who honor Him, who reverence Him. Those who have a holy fear for the Lord are the ones who walk closely with Him. Those who will remain on the highway, those who will remain away from the ditches, and those who will allow the Holy Spirit to influence their lives. Don't you hear this last part? The second part of that says, He will make them know His covenant. I love this. Covenant in the Hebrew. I love this. Covenant in the Hebrew, it means an alliance of friendship. An alliance of friendship. It's the relationship that God had with Adam and Eve before the fall of man. It says in the Scripture... Right? That in the cool of the day that he would come into the garden and he would what? Fellowship with them. He had friendship with them. He came to them. <laughs> Do you want to have that kind of relationship where at times, like the Spirit of God, just, you just sense his presence, his manifest presence. Like all of a sudden you just want to sing or you want to shout or you want to pray or you just, he just draws near. Yes, he says, you draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. But there are times he's looking for people who will walk with a holy fear so that he can just come and he can just fellowship with you. If you think that that's not so, you don't understand the Holy Spirit. We don't understand the person of the Holy Spirit. The covenant... We are able now to, He desires a friendship alliance with us now. Why? Because now there's a new covenant. And His name is Jesus. And because if you are under the blood of Jesus, forgiven, if you're under the covenant of Jesus, this relationship, then you have every right 
to be in fellowship and friendship with the Lord God, but it requires a reverence for who he is. A reverence. This is what this verse is telling us. That God has an alliance of friendship available to those who fear him, who have a holy, honoring, reverential fear, and that will allow his Holy Spirit to touch their lives. There is a connection, a direct connection between the fear of God. Don't zone out. I'm almost done. Between the fear of God and the Holy Spirit, there is a direct connection according to the word. And in these last days, we have got to understand the importance of living and abiding under both. Because none of us are exempt from what's coming. And I think that many people understand what it, or they or they say, they, they verbalize, I know what it is to fear God. Like they understand he's all-knowing, right? He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. They understand that. So they, they have this, what they say is a, a fear of God because they understand how big he is. Like that he's God. And that's a good thing. And then we have people that truly understand who Jesus is. The son of man who was the son of God. Who came, who laid down his life. So that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. They understand that. But I'm telling you, there's a great misunderstanding and an ignorance about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. It's a he. It's not an it. He is just as important as God the Father, God the Son. He is God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said these words in the Great Commission. We know the Great Commission. Before he left the earth, what did he say? Go make disciples of all nations. What did he say? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. To baptize in the Greek means under the covering of. To submerge. He was saying, go and tell everybody that there's a way that they can be saved. That there's a way they can be restored back to God's plan. And then cover them up with all that they need about the Father, about the Son, and about the Holy Spirit. Don't just preach about one thing and leave the other out. You're not teaching the fullness of the Scripture. But don't get so focused on the Holy Spirit that you forget to fear God. God, help us. This, this, this under, misunderstanding, it's, it's, a lot of times it's where things have gotten out of balance. People do something and they call it the Holy Spirit and you're like, oh, wow, no, that wasn't the Holy Spirit, that was just flesh. You know, and, and if that's happened to you, I don't know some of your backgrounds, then I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead. Matthew, you guys, come on. The Holy Spirit, he's not weird. He's God. <laughs> he's our helper. It's all in the Word. He's our comforter. Oh, he gives us good gifts. Right? He gives us good gifts. He gives us love, joy, peace, patience. Oh, goodness, that one's a hard one sometimes, but he gives it to us. We may have to go through trials to get it. Goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Hear me. The Holy Spirit is not like wildfire that's out of control. Why would he give you self-control if he's out of control? Why would he give you... Uh, why would he be out of control when he tells you in the word to do things decently and in order? He's powerful, but he's in control. We need his influence in our lives. And he desires to be intimately involved in our lives every day. And he is the one who helps us to understand and walk in the fear of God. He is the one who helps us to understand Scripture. 
He's the one that helps us to be able to understand and to truly have a spiritual sense, discernment, what's going on around me. I'm telling you, you cannot have, you cannot be a Holy Ghost junkie and forget the fear of God. But you can't be so stuck in religious things that you do not allow the Holy Spirit to move you. We have to be settled in both. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and life to the fullest. The only way you will have the life that he describes is when you walk and you live and you move and you have your being in the fear of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit. The only way. I'm not going to go any further in this today. But after Easter, we're going to start a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. Because I believe it's so important that the church really understands who He is. For today, this is what I sense in my heart. God is, He's zealous about His church. There's a zeal in His heart for His church. He gave His best. He gave His one and only Son, Jesus, so that whosoever would believe in Him, would call on Him. Right? It says that they they don't have to worry. They can have everlasting life with Jesus. Hallelujah. The Garden of Eden. When you study the Garden of Eden, Eden was unrestrained pleasure. Until the fall of man, until sin came. Do you understand all God is doing? He's restoring everything that was taken from us when sin came. He gave us Jesus to forgive us of our sins, to give us access to heaven. And now he's given us the Holy Spirit as our guide, as our helper, so that we can stay on this highway of holiness. He's provided all that we need for life and for godliness. That's what that scripture's telling us. I've given my son for forgiveness and freedom from sin. I've given my Holy Spirit to help you now along the way. I'm just going to ask the Holy, I'm going to ask the, the worship team if they'll just play something and if whatever they feel led to, to lead us in. I have a few questions for you this morning. The Holy Spirit of God, He's full of wisdom and understanding, He's full of counsel and strength, He's full of knowledge and the fear of God. I want to ask, let me just do this. I want to pray right quick. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you now, Father, that there would be a settling of your Holy Spirit in this room. Father, we know that you're here, but Lord, for the manifest presence of your Spirit to come and deal with our hearts, Lord Jesus. God, that in your presence, Father, that we would just, we would, we would be real. We would allow you, God, access to all that we are because you have an unconditional, unfailing love for us. And God, you desire to teach us what it is to honor you, to reverence you, to fear you. But you also desire to show us what a friend we have now. What a friend we have in Jesus. Holy Spirit, Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in this place. These are my questions to you today as they sing and as they play. Are you where you need to be with Jesus? Are you where you need to be on this highway of holiness? Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're here and you need to give your life to him today. Or maybe you know that you're not where you should be and you just want to recommit your life to Him. He is here today. My second question is this, are you lacking in a holy fear and a reverence of the Creator? 
Are you lacking in a holy fear and an honor of the Lord Almighty? When Solomon wrote the words in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, seven times in seven verses, he said this. He said, remember him. Remember him. Remember your creator. He said, remember him. Remember him. Remember your creator. Remember him. He said it over and over seven times. Remember him. I want to ask you today, remember him. Ask him. God, what would you have to say? about my life is my life pleasing to the father are there things that because he loves me so much that he wants to rid my life of are there gifts that he wants to give me my third question are we too close to one ditch or the other is our love growing cold because of everything happening in the world is our love for people is it growing cold because of the distractions of life is our love for the things of the Lord and, the, and, and, and just God himself the, the relationship with Jesus is it growing cold is it waning is it cooling off we need to be real with God because this affects our eternity and he says if you will just draw near he will light a fire inside your heart again for him. The last question, are we living life too close to the other ditch based on wrong teaching? Based on teaching that negates the truth of the scripture. Maybe it's taken out of context. Are we living life based on teaching that weakens, hear me, that weakens the power of the scripture. We will not know the answer to these questions if we don't ask him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want us just to take some time before we leave today. I'm going to ask them to just, to, they can sing and play what they want. If you, if you want to get to the altar, you can come to the altar. And if you need prayer, we'll be here to pray with you. Please don't leave this place today without asking God what he thinks of your life right now. Because I promise you, he says he will be found by those who search with all their heart. If you will turn your heart to him and truly Seek his face. He will answer you. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, we're available. If you need Jesus, if you've not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I'd love it if you'd come front into the front and we would pray with you. I need you to hear me. This altar is not just for salvation. This altar is a place just to meet with God.
sit and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. By your presence, Lord. From this place, Lord. Be at once. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up. 
always better. God, you're always better. God, to shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the wall of all my religion. You're always better. God, you're always better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. You're always always better I will make room for you do whatever you want to God do whatever you want to God I will make room for you do whatever you want to do whatever you want to Looking around, what you do in others? Look what you do in me. My heart's an open space for you.
Jesus, we love you so much, Lord God. Oh, Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that when you walked upon this earth, you gave us an example of what it looks like to love the Father. Thank you, God, in your word for the admonition that we are to walk out that love as Jesus walked. Thank you, Jesus, that you prayed for us your very last prayer, that the love that the Father has for you would be in us, Lord God, and that you would be in us, and we would be in you, and we would all be one together, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that you prayed that we would have love for one another, love born from the Holy Spirit, Lord God, unity in the Trinity, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you walked a very narrow path in the fear of God the Father. Not as a restriction, but as a beautiful path to freedom in you. Lord, help us to keep our bare feet in your warm footprints, God, on that highway to holiness, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, that when we get to that place, Lord Jesus, where it's all opened up and it's all revealed, that the beauty of holiness, Lord God, will cause that rush of the joy that will overtake us, God, in that new day. Lord, we'll be so thankful that we walked in the fear of the Lord. And there's not a, any way that we could get there without the help of your Holy Spirit. God, we honor you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we pray this is our prayer increase our love for you. Help us to do those two commandments, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Increase love in these days, Lord God. Increase, increase clarity, Jesus. Increase wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord to keep us in your loving way. Lord, draw us near to your spirit. Give us ears to hear you and eyes to see you and a heart that says, yes, I will follow after you. God, we honor you. We love you. Bless my brothers and sisters, God. Let this message, Jesus, rest in us change us and conform us to your image, Lord, we pray in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Lord, amen.